Friends, colleagues, listeners, welcome again. Here we are, and we're going through uh, another chapter with David Van Miller of Turbulence. And um, I'm enjoying it as we're going through it again now, as much as I did when I read it the first time. Um, now, David, as you know, is a 50-year aviation veteran. He's an author. And as people have probably seen from these sessions, he's also a great storyteller. So, David, welcome back again, sir. Lovely to have you. Well, thanks for having me, Chris. Good to see you again. Likewise, likewise. So here we are. This is our fourth session and we're covering chapter three titled At the Airport. And one of the things that I'd like to start with is what you wrote almost near the beginning of the chapter. You wrote air travel is growing exp exponentially with the infrastructure of old airports barely able to handle the changes that are happening around the globe. Well, my goodness me, uh, how incredible that we're talking today with so much that's happened when you reflect back on that, which was around 2019? Well, as I ramble through history, to give you some examples of airports and what they've dealt with, let's call it 50 years. Yep. I remember when the 747s came out, Boeing was running around all the airports, as, as were airlines, the big airports, talking about everything from uh, stress levels on runways to capacity at a gate so how many jetways and at LAX, we started with three jetways over the front, over the wing and the back. Today, I think they use one or two. It's just a different environment. But so back then, actually before then, if you remember the 707s, they came uh, sideways. Yeah. yeah. And the jetway went to the front and to the rear. And I remember it wasn't me, but a guy where I was working at, in Chicago at the time, uh, Whatever he did, the jetway came off the foundation before it went to the airplane. Because, you know, you had to go around the, the wing, the tail of the wing to get to the rear. And it was motorized. You actually drove it. Yeah. Back in that day. Now it's a whole different scene. Yeah. So you, you take it from those nuances. Now you nose in, as an example. And the uh, airport designers will tell you about the capacity increases with a nose in. So you had the runway issue and then you had the capacity of the gates issue that has changed over the years. And then the 380 comes along. Yep. Yep. And that's a whole other story, right? Because now you're talking, uh, I don't know, a million pounds minimum. That That's gross takeoff weight, but it's very heavy. And not every airport can take it either because of the weight, of course, or the length of the runway. And the 380s are unfortunately, maybe they've seen their best day already. But that was another example where certain airports had to adjust. Then you get into how airports manage slots and airlines that want to come in, like new entrants, because real estate is real estate and it's important. And back in the day, you signed long-term leases. Yeah. So you could prevent a startup from coming in, like a JetBlue, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. All that's changed because the airport said, well, no, wait a minute, this environment has to change. We need counter space for virtually everybody. And of course the FAA as the grand wazir of this stuff said, you can't preclude people by using real estate. So in many airports now they call it the cute system, but basically they're like terminal neutral. So you can, airlines can move between the different check-in positions and they all go to their own, yeah. you know, computer systems, but they can use a, a universal. Yeah. And the same with gates. I mean, they rotate gates around now too. So now they, they do, but it's, it's amazing how it's amazing how people are animals of, of, uh, you know, customer. They always still like to go to where they remember they went the last time they went into that terminal. It's crazy. And it, and a lot has changed. Look at what happened. You know, this very well, Chris terminal five for British airways is just fabulous. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, it took them years. Uh, and the connecting, they've got that pretty well nailed down with the bus coming down at the bottom of Terminal 5 and taking these other terminals. But Terminal 5 is just spectacular. And uh, that's an example of, let's say, new age. But given all of that, COVID shows up. Yeah, right? yeah. Oh, excuse me. TSA shows up and then COVID. They're two big landmarks, right? <gasps> You know, years ago, and I mentioned before, people were hijacking airplanes to Cuba and other places. And I was involved in that in the early 
and mid seventies at LAX. So we started with the screening process, but it was rudimentary. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, very much more sophisticated today. So you, you had that security issue, which changed the environment at the airports, right? I mean, yeah. dramatically. Yeah, huge, huge. Coming to the yeah. gate, say goodbye. Yeah, no families going down, waiting for them to get on and come off. And God. And now with COVID, you're lucky to get into the terminal. Yeah. And once you're in the terminal, you're in a surreal world, not just with your mask, but they're pushing and pushing everything from biometrics. Delta's talking about that, yeah. you know, where your eye can rec you put your optics in there in your eye and it says you're okay and you get your boarding pass. In other words, touchless. Yep. So the airports in concert with the airlines are moving towards touchless. Yeah, which is a good thing, which is a very good thing. And again, just whilst we're talking about when you wrote this, you know, when you wrote this, obviously everything was going well and there was, you know, there was expected growth and everything else. It was, it was a different world. And now we're sitting here talking about how you felt and what you thought during that particular time. And another thing that you mentioned in there was you said on Labor Day in 2019, there were 17 million travelers passed through the U.S. airports alone. Now that puts things in perspective. And now... I mean, look, look, look what it's like now. It's, it's incredible. So the airports that, that have become little villages and cities, they're completely empty. Retail, food and beverage, everything. I mean, it's an incredible, they're combining terminals now because they can't keep all the terminals open. Yeah, that happened at Gatwick. That's happened at uh, Dallas, I believe, a couple of other airports, a lot yeah. of airports. Yeah, yeah. And uh, while we're on that subject, they are, you, you mentioned ecosystem, ecosystem, that's a good terminal, terminology to use. But in addition, they're their own financial center. Yeah. And they yeah. also support the environment around them. Like yeah. Gatwick pays the cities and the areas and the governments around Gatwick Airport, which they can't do. So all of a sudden, it's not just the airport itself and the airlines that are hurting, but it's all the employees at the airport. Yeah. Lot, thousands and thousands of employees, yeah. the vendors, you're right, closed. And then the communities that enjoy both the benefits from an employment point of view and a tax revenue point of view are also getting murdered. Exactly. The ripples, the ripples from that big stone dropping into the pond are now starting to come out all the way to the bank and it's affecting everybody. Yes. And, and, and it's going to continue for some about, time. You might be familiar with the slot issue because at yeah. Heathrow particularly, they were saying, well, wait a minute. I think the airport authority started this, but some of it gets political, as you know. Yep. If you don't use your slot, you lose it. So use it or lose it. But wait a minute. With the pandemic, we're canceling all these flights. So are you telling me that my slots are in jeopardy? So it's sort of the haves and the have nots, because if, you, if you've got the slots, you want to keep the slots. If you don't have enough slots, you're probably going to be lobbying to say, well, wait a minute. Yeah. But there's a there's a little bit of a balance now. So with the 8020 and the waiver, the waiver concept, you know, there's still new entrants now getting a chance, but obviously the waiver is allowing is allowing the old school. But I think you know the capacity is going to drop. There's going to be some free, there's going to be some free spaces and good balancing uh, as it comes out because of the capacity that's been taken off. Um, but it's incredibly different times, incredibly different times. Now, both of us, and we've spoken before. And you've got a huge amount of respect for everybody associated, shall we say, with this ecosystem. And also, you know, every single person at an airport or a mini town or city, part of that ecosystem has a place, has an impact and shares in the success of assisting and supporting people for travel, regardless or irrespective of what their motivational reason is. So that group of people and when people sit on an airplane, David, um, you know, they look out the window Obviously, they see the crew, they've seen the check-in agents, they've seen people, you know, uh, you know, just as they've come into the airport. But suddenly, when they're on the ramp and they're on that aircraft, they suddenly, they see all the movement, they see the dollies, the tugs, they see the fuel in the catering, they see people in flashing, flashing lights, they see so much. They see the tower. There are so many different careers and different interface jobs that work together as that unique team that make that entire ecosystem work as well as it does. And there's hundreds of people that will work an individual flight. And what you don't see as a passenger around the airplane itself, right? Yeah. You've got the baggage outbound bag room. You've got the air freight 
building and facility. Yep. You know, the mail uh, post office facility it's in big yep. airports is, is on the terminal site, right? Yep. So you have the dining unit. So these other units you don't really see, but they're all working together to get that one flight out on time from that individual gate. Yep. And I wish people had a better understanding. Passengers, when they lean back and they look at this machine and they just think about the airplane, they really don't have a good understanding or appreciation for how that all works. And it's much more than just the guy that you look out the window and sees loading your bag. Yeah. I it's think there's a bag room, it's the, it's the dining unit, it's the mechanic that walks up to double check everything, it's the fueler. I mean, it's a long, long list. I think every carrier moving forward and every lounge when there's waiting areas and and restaurants or whatever, I think everybody should make a concentrated effort of having sort of like a a profile or a documentary of the airport and what goes into operating an airport so people get a better understanding and they can see what goes on. A, because it, it will be a great a great advert for for the next generations to come into the industry because now they're paying more attention to it but also for passengers and everybody else to see and to understand the nuances the difficulties you know the the detail that goes into it and perhaps coming to a point shortly about appreciating what goes on on the odd occasion and i say the odd occasion when things don't go as well as planned yeah, and then what happens, as an example, and I think I might have mentioned this in the book, we're in a different world today because if there's a problem on the airplane before yep. pushback, and I, every once in a while you see a drunk get on the airplane and then he's escorted off or somebody does something wrong, but it puts so much pressure on the people involved. And let's just take the gate agent. Gate yep. agent is the CEO of the airline. Yep. I'm not there. Yep. So he's the last point of contact before you get on that airplane. They also have to make judgments. And from time to time, you'll hear about flight attendants complaining that that person should not have been put on board. So, and in today's environment, you've got the mask issue, you've got the COVID issue. In addition to all the normal things that they have to deal with, overbooking, yep. seat assignment, seat yep. changes. A lady at the last minute, a couple of weeks ago, I was coming back to Dublin from, from London and, uh, it was uh, Air Lingus. And the lady walked up with four kids and said, we want to sit together. Well, <laughs> excuse me, but flight is 95% full. Everybody's got a seat assignment and they're boarding by row from the rear. And they're serious about it this time yeah. because of the COVID environment, right? They moved a bunch of people around and figured out a way. I think they took care of most of what her needs were, but that was a gate agent. Yeah. It was an oversell. They have to deal with it. Yeah. And not everybody has the fortitude, character, the uh, common sense sometimes. Yep. To deal with that. And as I noted, the person that walks up to you at the gate could be going through a divorce, going to a funeral, going to litigation, losing their business, going on holiday. All the myriad of things that are part of life are at that gate. Yep. And, and if somebody, a customer is overreacting, it could be for reasons that the gate agent doesn't know. Yep. So you have to be sort of uh, neutral in a way in how you approach passengers because they all have their own issues and frustrations and demands. And I mentioned before that your best friend is the gate agent. So when you have a problem and you walk up with your family and you can't and flights delayed for three hours and you're not sure you're going to Orlando to Disneyland, you scream at the gate agent who happens to be the only person that did not cause that delay, right? <laughs> the only person. And he's the person or she is the person that is most able to help you. So explain to me, Mr. Customer, why you are yelling and screaming at your safety valve. Yeah. Think about it. Yeah. That's and what I'm saying. There. That's what I'm saying, David. And you know, I, I mean, I've looked at so many times, and, and on occasion, I've I've actually stepped in as well, which rightly or wrongly, I, I did anyhow. But um, you look at so many examples, and you think to yourself, now, a, why aren't the gate agents getting more help? Why isn't there better information? Why isn't the information relayed in a better way? And also, certain messages now, I I really really feel that a lesson coming out of this pandemic 
is that people should appreciate people more and yeah. people should try and understand what they have to deal with in their respective jobs. And if that can be helped with, you know, social media or with videos or with, you know, utilizing people's downtime when they have to sit in lounges or wait in queues or whatever, then, then we need to, we need to start looking at how we can do that now to support people not getting crazy and going overboard and overreacting because at the end of the day, it can also ruin other people's experience because they're either in close proximity or they're sitting behind or in front of the people. And you don't want to hear somebody who's always moaning or there's always a problem, you know? So I hope that this, this care and appreciation element will start to, you know, will continue to flow over after, after this pandemic starts to ease itself a bit. You know, technology has made some interesting uh, improvements in how you handle a problem flight. Uh, Delta, American, most of the carriers now do that. So you walk up to the gate and the flight is, let's say, canceled. Yeah. In Delta and American's case, they have a center to go to. Everybody goes over to that center, not the gate, because yeah. that's dynamic, but a customer service center that's handling multiple flights. This is really good during weather problems, particularly yeah. in places like Chicago. The other thing that, that I think Delta was the first to do it was rather than the gate agent trying to find reprotection for you. The reservations people have a special section and the computers do it. So you go to this section, you put in your old boarding card and it prints out a new boarding card with your new flight and your new seat. So you, it, it's so much different than what it used to be. God, I remember my first time as a gate agent. You know, oh, I, well, thought, yeah. I, I was in Chicago and I was a management trainee and people were, you know, what's this guy going to be a supervisor? He's only 24 years old. I wasn't a supervisor then, but so they tossed me to the wolves. That's what they did. So I worked uh, the standby gate at O'Hare oh. in a snowstorm. And people would come up to me. I, I say a lot of people. It was at gate one, I think. It was the first gate. In yeah. the, in G, I think, G or H. And you had to get seat assignments downstairs. So you would call. From, from your podium there with everybody yelling at you downstairs. Yep. And I remember I called down to get a seat to Philadelphia and there was laughter at the other end because they knew the position that I was in and they were not gonna help me. <laughs> and then you have other people that come up and they used to flip out the ambassador card. Yeah, so, yeah. I'm an ambassador member. Yeah, sort me out now. I'm really happy for you. But <laughs> if there's eight people ahead of you going to Philadelphia and you're number nine. And that, that, that was real world. Today's technology has resolved or facilitated a better understanding and management of that process, which on a good day is hard. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And you mentioned there about on the standby desk, um, obviously traveling as an as a airline staff and you're on standby and depending which carrier you're on, you know, you're lower down the pecking order than, than you'd like to be. Way down. Way down. Looking back and, and reading your book, um, there's one area in there where you mentioned you mentioned clearly about smoking and normally smoking at the back of the airplane. Now, whenever you were given the standby seats, you were normally sent down the back. And the thing that used to annoy me was why would somebody who smoked want to sit up the front, but then come down and spread all that smoke at the back? That used to drive me mad. And, you know, you could see particularly I'm thinking about the old 707s, but even, even down to the early time of the 747s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could look in the back and you could see almost like a fog, right? Yeah, yeah. Front's clear in the back. And I, those poor flight attendants that were stuck working yeah. in the back, I mean, they, they were really exposed. All that's gone now, of course, but back then it, was, uh, it wasn't fun. But in, in many cases, people said, I just want to get there. Yep. So I'll take whatever I can. And we always had this motto as a non-rev that uh, just get me in the same direction. If I can't get the flight I That's want, yep. just, just make sure I'm headed east. You yep. know what I mean? We're headed west and I'll figure it out from there. Just take what you can get. Yeah, no, I agree. Many times when I was living in the States and working there, uh, I had the same attitude. You know, if you were going from coast to coast, you'd go anywhere where there was decent connection, say, That's all right. I'm getting there. I'm moving forward rather than stay, yeah, I agree with you. Now, recognition and respect of everybody that 
helps make an airport operate in such inclement weather conditions and differences and seasons, etc. And you mentioned in the book about baggage handlers. My God, you know, the things they have to do and the conditions, you know, getting into the bellies and sorting things out in the old days, that was an absolute, literally a backbreaker and a knee, a knee nobbler. It was terrible. It's a little bit easier these days, but it's still tough because the larger uh, airplanes, of course, have pods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pods are loaded through an automated system in the outbound bag room. So when you check in a bag, it goes through the automation. There's a reader that reads the tag and sends it to a spur and that spur Sometimes it went to the wrong spur, but for the most part, to the right spur, goes in the container, and then the caner, container gets wheeled out and put on a, this lift and zipped right in. But you still have a lot of hard work uh, with loaders, particularly the smaller airplanes, and the rear, where, where like on a 747, you still had to manually put bags in the rear. Yeah. A really tough job. What interested me, Chris, was not just the guy that you're watching loading it, but how did the bag start? Well, the bag started at the counter or the curb, goes through the system, goes to the spur. Somebody puts puts that on in one of the pods or in the old days, you know, just one of those containers. It gets wheeled out. They have to do weight and balance. So you can't just throw all the air, all the bags on an airplane. Yep. They were assigned places in the forward or the rear or however big the airplane is to facilitate weight and balance because if you get this sheet, I used to do both jobs, right? You get the sheet that says, put X number of bags in the front. You have to, you can't deviate because then it affects weight and balance and the trim setting and the takeoff with the trim and, and could have safety issues yeah. ultimately yeah. if not done properly. So you have that whole thing going on the sidelines and then you've got the freight component coming in because these guys are working the air freight terminal like we did like on the midnight shift in freezing weather, right? Yeah, yeah. Truckers. You, you put the freight on and then the freight goes to the airplane and that has a weight and balance issue. So does the mail. So all those things come together at the airplane and then you've got, let's call it a lead ramp service agent. Yeah. Who's supervising this dynamic. Red cap. Yep. And he's got the green sheet, load sheet uh, now, which says here's where everything's got to go. And then he has to sign off on it. So it's, it's physical and it's also mental because you have to watch exactly what is loaded where in addition to the hard work and particularly in inclement weather, it's not an easy job. Yeah, no, no, I tell you, I've got a lot of respect, a lot of respect for, for you know, for everybody. And, you know, if you've worked in place, I, I, I lived, I lived also in Scandinavia. Oh my God, some of the cold, the, 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 it was just unbearable. You're, you, the, the water in your eyes would almost freeze, you know, and then, well, you know, Chicago very well. I mean, that was cold, New York, it's incredible. So fair play to those boys, you know, boys and girls now it's it's incredible what they've done now something else that you talk about at the airport that's changed is the way is the way the airport operated so in the in the old days you know people expected a meal they expect they they had to work with a paper ticket so you spoke about the family you know wanting to sit on the same seats you know in the old days you had to you had to pay for it apply for the ticket you had to wait for it to come in the post if you lost it if you lost it you were in dire straits Whereas now everything is so convenient, but in those days, you know, it was it was so much, so much of a of a bigger thing, and and a, and a more importance around that whole principle of travelling. I remember first days as a ticket agent at O'Hare. You know, get this long line, and you're trying to process people through. And I say for the record, I wasn't the best ticket agent. You know, they used to constantly say, "Well, you're not balancing your receipts and all this stuff." And, but it's, it wasn't an easy job. And you had a tariff this thick. Yeah. So you actually had to manually calculate if it wasn't done by reservations. You yeah. had to manually calculate, you know, okay, from Chicago to London to Rome and the connection and the return and, and that kind of thing while the line behind somebody in, in front gets longer and longer. And then you gave them a paper ticket and they paid for it. And in, in some cases, we caught some agents where they, they'd had the ticket and they kept the the coupon, the receipt for checkout yeah. the ticket goes to the gate. The gate agent has the ticket. The gate agent pulls the ticket, puts it on the airplane. But in some cases, you can't do it now. They would take that coupon and in concert with the guy at the counter, hand it back and they would void the ticket if somebody paid for cash. 
and they actually have the cash. I mean, that, that was rare, but you ran into situations like that before, or what we used to call pending flights, yep. where the count didn't match. So we said, well, wait a minute, we have, like, yeah. we have 102 people on the airplane. Yeah. So we, we sent it out pending. Uh, and then people said, well, wait a minute, who's on the airplane and should be on the airplane, of course, with security and so on. And automation, that improved dramatically. But people that fly today don't really have an appreciation probably for the advances of technology and what it's really done to the process of the passenger boarding an airplane and baggage and cargo and mail. Yeah, yeah. it's amazing what people take for granted now, which also, which also is quite funny because what people have done and compromised on now is they've compromised on a meal and they've compromised on seat space if it if it's cheaper and then you've got in-flight entertainment in the old days in-flight entertainment was a newspaper a book or you spoke to the person next to you Man. whereas now now with films and their own videos and their own ipads and phones and whatever it's it's a lot easier i think to manage that particular time um, than it was before the amount of attention that has to be given to every single individual has changed as well yeah, and as an example, I think British Airways started this. I know America does it as well, where you can, when you check in online or make your reservation 30 days or less in advance, you can pick your meal. Yeah. I mean, first class or, or business class. That relieves spoilage. It facilitates the flight attendant not having to say, well, we only have this left. So it's, and that's a technology piece. It's a small little piece. When you're flying on British Airways, they know that your gold or silver, where you're sitting, they'll come up to you and say, yep, Mr. Benmo, thank, thanks for your business as a gold member. So the, the technology and the automation has really facilitated improvements to the customer that probably just accepts it. And I give credit to the IT departments, to yep. the airlines themselves and management for continuing to pursue improvements in automation, which ultimately affects the consumer in two ways. Cheaper flights, arguably, because you need less yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and bodies. And the second is better customer service. Now, yeah, they tighten up, but the airlines have tightened up a bit on space, but I'd like to say there is no free lunch. In other words, if there's just one seat on the airplane from LA to New York and you want to spend $30,000, it can be your airplane. But if it's two people, then you each spend 15,000 if it's 10 people. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, if, yeah. They, so if there's 200 seats on the airplane, the more seats, the less you are paying, theoretically. It doesn't yeah, yeah. work that way, but supply, demand, capacity of the airplane, uh, the demand for that route from A to B or A to B yeah. to C uh, causes part of that pricing drama. So when people complain about what you mentioned earlier was the change in the interior configuration of seats, Part of it's designed to allow more people to travel, particularly leisure. Yeah. yeah, I wonder, David, now, you know, when consumer confidence comes back and people look at what they did before and what's important in their life now, you know, what sort of what sort of expectations or different expectations they'll have and how they'll be able to influence it by, you know, by their footfall. And something that I hope, I genuinely hope happens is that either by by, by natural means that people like security and and immigration and officialdom, okay, that they start to lighten up a little bit, you know, and, and like you mentioned about the TSA. One of the things I think, I think I'm thinking to myself, where do they send these people to be trained to be that miserable and that direct instead of being supportive and thinking to themselves, my God, you know, there are people coming into the country or our fellow countrymen are leaving the country. Why not make it a more, a more enjoyable experience? I have noticed in my travels differences by airport. And theoretically, they have the same training manuals, the same selection process, supposedly. Although the pools of, let's call it talent for, for sake of the, the right word, is different by different communities and different Parts yeah. of the country, if not the world, some do a lot better than others. Uh, 
there's certain West Coast cities I probably should mention were absolutely awful. I mean, okay, San Francisco. <laughs> I can't tell you. International outbound TSA in San Francisco is to be dreaded. If you go through Dallas, you go through Heathrow. I mean, Heathrow's got it, like Terminal 5's got it down to a science. And so does Dublin Airport. And uh, LAX is pretty good. Uh, so some are different than others. Part of it's attitude, part of it's who you hire, part of it's the labor pool in yeah. the area that you're at, you know, because I think they probably all get either the same starting salary or might be different by the cost indexes, you know, by different cities around the country in the U.S. or in, in Europe. But yeah, it's uh, it's different. L let me tell you a quick story because people don't really understand this. When 9-11 happened, yeah. I was running Sun Country and the place shut down for days and I never saw a radar scope that had nothing. And Norm Mineta was Secretary of Transportation at the time. I knew Norm when he was mayor of San Jose. So he and I had a history. Great guy, great guy. And uh, he told me the story of what happened because he's the guy that actually with the president's approval, executed uh, the action to ground all the airplanes. Norm's the guy that pushed the button. And he told me the whole story later. And then he said, well, okay, now we need to figure out a way to process passengers. Yes. A, yeah. Ultimately TSA. But most people don't know was that Norm went, and he told me the story himself, so it is accurate. Went out and reached out to people like Disney because Disney were experts at Disneyland. Yeah, queues. large queues of people. Yeah, he asked them to come and initiate the training syllabus for the employees of TSA. Interesting idea. Now I got to tell you that they might have lost the manual. I'm not sure because it's. I've got to say I've never, I've never, I've never seen a TSA type person at Disneyland. That's for sure. Nor, nor security. That's the other. That's the other thing. I don't understand why the people at security, every person who puts their their belongings into one of those trays to be x-rayed why not just give them a smile and say hope you enjoy your trip and you know look after yourself there always seems to be conflict brewing under the surface in that environment i just i for the life of me can't work it out here's what i i think first of all there's tension as a matter of course in human behavior there's tension because it's not you versus them but it's sort of a not a police state but it's they are in control, make no mistake. And I made a mistake once by pushing back uh, with one of the processors about something that she proposed, which was ludicrous. And I went to the back of the line and they put that bug over there. And boy, if I had a tight connection, you did. So you have to be nice, whether you like it or not. And some of those folks take on a level of authority that they don't have in the rest of their lives, if you know what I mean. I'm not I trying to acknowledge this, but it happens, right? The more you travel, the more you see it. Yeah, yeah. So they, they take license with their badge, which isn't a badge, but it's a position, and they have a lot of power. They can make sure you don't go on that airplane. Yeah, so you yeah. Mouth shut and just say okay. So when you're saying be nice. The best thing a passenger can do is be nice no matter what happens, right? Because otherwise But if it's done if it's done genuinely, so if the passenger understands the monotony or the importance, whatever whichever way they want to see it, of the security screening, that's one thing. And then the other way around. But you could just see somebody makes a little bit of fun or they say enjoy you're going on holiday have a great time or they see somebody who's a businessman and say hope you know hope it works out hope you're successful or whatever you see people their shoulders go back they smile a bit more and then when they get through the rest of the process and get up to the final gate everybody's happy to get on and then the the, the you know the crew sees the cabin crew sees that these people are in good form the whole thing continues but that front end can actually destroy somebody's experience. And I don't understand why there isn't more of that put into the training. Well, th there should be, Chris, it's sort of like the human behavior uh, training that we used to give. And a lot of people probably still do it, airlines still do it. The I'm okay, you're okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, training. The way it's given, Dave, that's a little bit, makes you feel sick. Do you know what I'm saying? As if like, what in God's name are you telling me? I'm okay, you're okay. And you keep doing that bouncing back across 
Well, it's transactional analysis. It actually does work. Apparently, you don't think so, but it, but it does. It does work. I've, I trained a lot of flight attendants, gate agents in it, and it's sort of a trick. So when somebody gives you a hard time, there's a way of moving the conversation to to relax the situation. Oh yeah, yeah, of course there. And there's a method behind it all. I'm not I'm not damning that one particular type of training, but but some of these training courses, you know, they're they're theoretically they're fantastic. Practically, they're a lot more difficult. And, and, and I just think that we, we've got an opportunity now to communicate to everybody who's going to come back into this most valuable of, of pastime and opportunity to see the world and experience new things. We've got a chance now to bring it back better. Not, not build back better, but bring it back better. And just I hope, help, I hope you do. I, I, help I, I, people appreciate things point. more, you know? And, and God, how pleasant it would be. Do you know what I mean? So what one guy was there the other day, he said he came back into Heathrow and he said he was, there was only a handful of people came in. And one of the guys on the immigration desk, he said, ah, oh, he said, I'm so pleased to see you. He said, thank heavens people are coming in. And it lifted, it lifted his spirits, you know? And, and I just think, you know, there's so, you, you said in the book as well, there's so much goes on behind the curtain of an airport. And I think every single person, part of that community if they make people enjoy it, and you said certain airports, I think airports of the future are going to bring their communities together as a uniform marketing tool to compete against other airports as to why passengers would want to use that airport or why passengers would want to transit through the airport, whether it's the type of shopping, the beverage experience, whatever it is, or just the culture or the attitude of that airport. It's going to make a huge difference. Let me give you an example. You know Steve Wynn and the Wynn uh, casinos in yeah, those yeah. separate buildings. Uh, one of them's more upscale. I forget which one is which. But in any case, uh, they're all fabulous. Yeah. When you check in. I mean, Steve Wynn is meticulous about that and customer service and attitude. Yep. Yep. It's unbelievable. You know, when you check in and the whole process. But what really caught my attention is when we left. And we got into a queue to get a taxi going back to the airport. They had a concierge sort of guy yeah, yeah. that was handling the crowd and, and putting people into the taxis, which I'd never seen before. And this was only at the wind that I ever saw. I stayed at the MGM and some yep. others. And I asked the guy, I said, this is, why do you do this? He said, well, Steve Wynn thinks the environment that we create when you check in and when you leave are important, but the last smile you get is your last memory of our hotel. And that's why I'm here. And the last bit of help as well, which is incredible. Yeah. Oh, I, I, if I'm jumping ahead, excuse me, but on that, no, app, no. let me give you another example, just came to me. Uh, and I think I mentioned in the book was, I worked in, in the baggage lost and found office early on, right? That is not a fun job, by the way. Nobody comes and says, thank you. So they usually, I mean, I, we had a guy in LA that came in with an ax and chopped up the counter he, because he couldn't find his bag. I and mean, we had him arrested, this serious stuff. So anyhow, periodically when I go through an airport now, I will go up to the baggage service. They don't call it lost and found anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's more negative, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. All baggage services, it's the same thing. Anyhow, I would go up and say, Thanks, I got my bag. I really appreciate that. And you have no idea the looks that I get. I remember two two ladies in, I think it was LA, uh, but I've done a lot of places, Dublin, London, other places. And they looked at me like, nobody's ever done that. Yeah. I said, well, thank you. I have my bag. I suspect most people come here and scream and yell. You didn't lose the bag, but they think you did. Yeah. They scream and yell. I think every once in a while, it's nice to just thank you. Yeah. Interesting idea, yeah. huh? No, it does. It makes it makes a big difference, and and also now that that uh, where you're talking about the wind hotels and what goes on, if you look now the way airports have developed and some of the super super airports that are actually like they're almost like a destination in themselves, and people it will is. choose. Yeah, but but people, I know, I know, I, and and whenever I had the chance as well, you choose the hub because you know that if you've got a bit of a layover, you've got things to do, you've got nice things to do, it's in comfort. So you actually make the choice as well as obviously the price and et cetera and the, and the, and the route. But that type, of, that type of decision influencing is now becoming 
you know, very, very, very prominent. And some of the big airports, you know, like you look at now, um, you know, Hamad International in, in Doha, you look at obviously Dubai is always well known. Um, you know, the improvements now in Abu Dhabi, but also in Istanbul, you look at Chengi Airport in Singapore. I mean, they're incredible, incredible facilities and communities and ecosystems. And the one thing I've got, I've just got to pull your leg a little bit. In America, the airports are, you know, they're, they're, to be polite, they're not as good as they could or should be. No, you're right. I, I was thinking about Beijing as high on the list because they really build a whole new terminal because of the Olympics. And it's one of the best duty free you're going to find anywhere in the world. Yeah. Uh, I would say Beijing might even be number one. Of course, I spent time, I was in Burma and Myanmar about four or five years ago running an airline for a while there. And so I spent a lot of time in Bangkok in, in, in Thailand. And then I'd also go up to Beijing and go over to Singapore because we flew to Singapore. And Singapore, they can, can until the pandemic, was expanding for to build a whole new terminal. Yeah. And they are so sophisticated. They're so modern. They're so clean. Yep. Yep. And then take a look. Let's look at the other end of the spectrum, LaGuardia Airport, right? Oh, oh. it is. It's not third world. If there's another world after third world, that's what LaGuardia is. Although I think they've started some improvements, but they've got just so much real estate. You know, it's it's sort of hard. And runway space, Newark built some new terminals, so it may be a little bit better. San Francisco is constantly building. They've been building for like 30 or 40 years. Uh, Dallas keeps adding terminals. Thanks, yeah. primarily, I think, to American. Uh, and you might recall that when Kansas City, MCI, because there's, you know, Kansas City, Kansas, and Missouri, they're right yeah. next to each other. And I used to go there for training with TWA. When they built the MCI terminal, it was the first one that was kind of curved, like a crescent. Yeah. And the counters were where the curve is. Now, Dallas has it now in a lot of other places. So you get out at the curb and you walk in right to your ticket counter check-in position. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and then off to your gate. That kind of convenience we're seeing more and more of in airports around the world, but not enough. And in, in the US, I think maybe some of it's environmental, some of it's money and politics. Uh, and it, a lot has to do with uh, the local board of supervisors. Most of these airports in the US have a board of supervisors and they're politically appointed. So the mayor appoints them. So it's a lot of favoritism that goes around. So they might not be as structured in a certain way as you'd, as you'd like to see. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think ACI did a study and they, they reckon, like, which was in your book as well, that, um, you know, the redesign, remodeling, re whatever you want to call it, that there was an expected amount of expenditure necessary of, in excess of $120 billion. Now with the pandemic and with all the cash flow and the problems, those modernization programs, so much is going to be delayed by, by, by so long. So well, Dublin is building a, a new runway. Yep. Uh, and it should be completed next year. And they're going ahead with it, which I think is smart longer term. But the issue now is uh, landing between 11 at night and seven in the morning and taking off. We dealt with that years ago in Orange County because you couldn't take off out of John Wayne, Orange County before seven o'clock. Yeah. So we all used to say flight leaves at seven, you know, like eight airlines said seven o'clock, right? We started queuing up at quarter of seven yeah. to the tower. Who could get to the, you know, so that you're first in line with the tower. And they're facing that here. What I find odd, and I sort of understand it is, okay, the airport was here before you, Bought your house or yes, 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 yes. Hundred percent agree. Hundred percent agree. I've I've always lived near the airports, and it in 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 part it's because it's convenient where you, where you work, where you live. You got the speed, and you accept the noise. And then to come up later on and say, you know, this isn't good because now there's more opportunity. I, you know, I've got mixed feelings about that, which is uh, which is not. I I don't think it's right, but. Um, and, and the amount of work that the airports generate. And I know people talk about the environment, but that's also being addressed now. Um, so that's good. But now before we finish something, and we're talking about now treat people as you would like to be treated. And you mentioned a gentleman's name, George Hammersley. You mentioned his name 
going back to the 60s and TWA and about how he approached conflict? George, for whatever reason, had two ambitions in life. The first was to see as much of the world and cities as he could. And as a non-rev, you know. Good on him. Good on him. Yeah. I haven't heard from him in years, but I hope he did. The other was he loved to work conflict-related flights, a.k.a. oversales, right? Yep. yep. Because there are oversales all the time. It's just, it's different now because we pay people. The yep. computer models are better at predicting no-shows, but you got to have some overbooking. You'll never, you'll go out of business if you don't overbook because people still no-show probably 20, 25 percent. It's worse around Thanksgiving. But George loved to work oversold flights. And he had this, so I watched him. I, I sat in the background once because I said, this is going to happen to me. So I want to find out what tricks of the trade he uses. He had a great personality. He always smiled. You thought he was your best friend and he could take pressure like nobody else. And he was sort of neutral to the pressure being put on him, if you can imagine. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. Stories yeah. Of, of a father telling his son to go kick the gate agent in the legs so that the father can race onto the airplane. This stuff happens all the time, not as much lately, but it still happens, human behavior. So anyhow, George had this idea. So now, now Chris walks up and he's oversold first class going to New York and he's gotta go. So Chris, uh, er, so George says, Chris, we have a problem and you have an opportunity. We're oversold and you are the lucky one because we are gonna take care of you. We are gonna send you back up to the club. Drinks are on me. We've got you on this next, next flight three hours from now. And we're gonna take very good care of you. And when you're on that flight, you're gonna be a super duper VIP and they're waiting for you in the lounge. Okay, thank you, George. I appreciate that. Yeah. That was George. He took a bad, you know, this lemon thing. Yeah. <laughs> lemon. He said, basically, he managed the person more than the process. And he could analyze people very quickly and see, well, what's their hot button? And, you know, it's interesting if you, I've read a bunch of books on human behavior and how you can understand somebody and whether they're telling you the truth or not, or whether they're sensitive, you know, when they're doing something like this, when they're talking to they're probably not telling exactly the truth. Watch it sometime or, or the eye contact and whether they answer it and you go down and like, he said, ah, maybe I better ask that question again. George was good at analyzing human behavior and that person in front of them. And he treated it as a positive and he took sort of the air out of the balloon of frustration of the passage. And it didn't work all the time because nothing usually does, but boy, he had a knack for it. Never forgot it. Yeah, brilliant. I'll tell you what, maybe we should have a George module that's 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 given to people now when when it when it comes back. So yeah, no, it makes a difference. But I think um, you know, the, the way airports have have modeled themselves, have formed themselves, have grown, and everybody that's associated with it, the sooner, please God we get them back up in operation, the better, you know, it's, uh, and, and hopefully, like I said, I hope, I hope to God, people remember how much they were desperate to get back in to an airport, through an airport, and just journeying, you know, as a result of an airport, and that everybody is a lot, lot more caring, and, uh, you know, and, and try and make it a nice, pleasant time. Well, there's a lot of pent-up demand, as you can appreciate. Yeah, yeah. Let's see what comes out the other end of that, because it's yeah. going to be hopefully brisk i think frankly it's going to take a while it's going to take more than this year yeah you take two years to kind of get through all of this between the vaccines are going to be critically important and it's interesting that president biden and his administration just came out with this mandate about masks and what people might not realize is the airlines by the conditions of carriage which has been printed on paper tickets forever and yeah 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 there, right the airline is allowed to require a mask as a condition of carry. Yeah, yeah, and if yeah. you violate that, you don't fly. This is yeah. before the uh, resolution by the government that just came out what, last week. It was already there and airlines were following it. The problem was the flight attendants union particularly, and, and I applaud them for this, on behalf of their membership was saying, we need to be able to say it's a federal mandate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, like no smoking. Like yeah. smoking in the, in the lavatory, right? 
exactly. Yeah. So come out with us. Why it took him so long? I swear, I, I just don't know. I, I started talking about this when I was giving interviews back in March and April of last yeah. year when the pandemic hit yeah. and saying it ought to be mandated right away. There's a lot of controversial things that governments decide. This one wasn't very controversial. It yeah, no, a- I agree. And I, I was the same, David. I could not understand why people just didn't say, right, that's it. You wear a mask all the time. You don't wear a mask, you don't come in. You don't wear a mask, you don't get on. You don't wear a mask, we're not, we're not serving you. End of story. That's it. Well, you know, we, we came up with years ago, and it was controversial. You had to wear a seatbelt. You get your ticket if you don't wear a seatbelt. You can't smoke in, in a restaurant. A lot yeah. of pushback. Yeah. That's out there now. And especially the pubs in Ireland. Yeah, and the and the crackdown on drunk driving, which has not been perfect, obviously, but it's cut down on a lot of deaths because of the irresponsible behavior of some yeah. folks. So you, so you have these mandates that today people don't think anything about putting on a seatbelt. They understand it. Yeah, or, yeah. Or the, the non-smoking or some of these other regulations and why it took so long to do something like this the airlines had the lead, by the way. The airlines and the flight attendants union took the lead on this and did it before the feds did it. Yeah. No, it's good. It's good. It all boils down again. People and change. People and being told. You know that's why some some areas have been have been better at addressing things because of the type of culture and government. But at the end of the day, everybody has to realise everybody's only safe when everybody's safe, yeah. and we need to share that around. So, David. It's another end of a end of a, a little session. As always, it's lovely. And um, in two weeks' time, we'll be doing chapter four inside the corporate office. So that'll be good. And oh, um, interesting, trust me. I yeah 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 yep. Yeah. It's got the what I've got to admit. The chapter that I'm looking forward to is the um, seven four seven size egos. That's that's the one that I'm looking forward to doing. Okay, you're not talking about me, right? No, okay, Dave. How could I ever? How could I ever? <laughs> Seriously, my friend, it's always a pleasure. You're a great storyteller, and uh, it's always good to see what's happened. And like I said, the fact that this book was written so close to the pandemic, and now we're looking at the pandemic, but looking at the book the way it was, it's it's also, I, I, I love it. Every time I go through it, something catches my eye or makes me smile. So fair play to you. You did a great job. Thank you for that.